Thank you so much for the nice intro. And uh, let's start. So, good morning, everyone. How is everybody doing? Good. Good? All okay. right. Looking forward for a day? Yes. Okay. Great, great. So, uh, let's start because there is literally no time to lose because we've got uh, to discuss the 10 deadly sins of administrators about. Windows security and, and the current uh, amongst current threats in the, in the fr in infrastructure. A uh, couple of words uh, regarding myself. Um, so, well, basically, I'm the CEO of the company, which is called Secure, and uh, it's, it's it's a kind of a funny role because CEO means that I probably have something to do with the business, but uh, effectively, I'm the person that delivers penetration tests in our team. I established the company ten years ago. And uh, right now we are in, in four locations, not far from here, because in Switzerland, in New York, in Dubai, and in Poland, and originally I am from Warsaw. And uh, what do we do? Well, basically, or what do I do, uh, besides penetration tests, I do uh, research in security in various areas. So pretty much uh, every day I'm in touch with my team, I travel a lot, and we do R&D in security. Today I'm going to be mentioning things related with our research, which is, for example, data protection API, and uh, we managed to fully reverse engineer it. And that is also quite important um, within the application area, definitely as well, because um, it's really a matter of who has access to what kind of secrets. So that's going to be a very interesting subject to touch. Yeah? So all these scenes we're going to discuss, and uh, I'm looking forward, of course, to your questions. I'm always saying, and I mean, I know it's a keynote, but I'm always saying that whatever I'm in the world, I feel like home because I travel a lot. So hopefully you're going to feel like almost home today. And uh, if something will not be clear, I'm happy to explain later on. So regarding my like speaking experiences, as Cord was mentioning, uh, we all speak at different types of events, uh, things like Microsoft Ignite um, or Black Hat. Uh, I had a chance to be in uh, Vegas this year, or if you're going to be also at Black Hat in London, I'm speaking over there at our new research that we finished last week, literally, about um, extracting things from the domain controller's memory and what kind of interesting hot stuff is over there. So that's the flow. Uh, now, question is, what do we think about these sins? Like, how do they happen? And why, basically, we've got a list of a 10 deadly sins and why they are really deadly? So that's the big question out there. And uh, I think, uh, well, there are a bunch of stories uh, to, to mention. Uh, in general, when I'm traveling to the customer site and I'm about to do a pen test, I'm always very excited because every single pen test is different. You have fun, you get paid. What else could go wrong? Yeah, so it's always very nice. Like you are excited. What kind of systems, applications, technology is going to be around? That maybe they will be misconfigured, and that could be a point of entry. But unfortunately, when you get to the customer infrastructure, things look pretty much like that. Yeah, so you connect to the network, and then you are like launching the same attacks, and unfortunately, they work, and that's a problem. Yeah, so that's why I'm talking about the 10 deadly scenes, because there are things in the infrastructure that pretty much always work. And my goal for today, for the keynote, is that you're going to pick two out of 10 things that you could do better in the infrastructure and then eventually apply security. Uh, before we move on, uh, just a little story, because uh, I've been not really long time ago doing the pen test, uh, and that's more regarding this, in uh, your neighbor country, because this was in Belgium. And uh, it was actually quite funny because there was an administrator of the infrastructure. This guy, a very nice person, but I'm sure you know this kind of people, was spending time in this infrastructure for like from like 6 a.m. until like 10 p.m. Yeah, so he was working in this company for the past 20 years. And uh, this infrastructure was like a child. Yeah, so he was getting there. He, uh, he had like a personal affection. He didn't allow any other administrators to touch his system. So you can imagine uh, that th that was actually getting to a little weird direction. But that was really in, like indeed his child. So when I was doing the pen test to his child, that's definitely not something that he would like to have. So pretty much every single hour he was coming in and he was asking me a question, did you manage to get in? Did you manage to get in? And I was like, no, just like, come on, just let me do my job, yeah? And then like he was coming over and coming over and I was like, no, no, no. And then I was like, yes. And he was like, oh, he's got like tears in his eyes, yeah? And uh, he was like, okay, like what happened then? I'm like, well, I got a, your administrator's password. 
Yeah, you, you don't really say too much because I don't want him to play around with this stuff and like lock me out all the time I managed to get in. Yeah, so, and he was like, oh. uh, and he's like, and what's that? Oh, well, so I mentioned the password and that was actually the password of the local admin that I managed to get in. Uh, and he was like, oh, you get a password to the domain admin. Oh no. <laughs> and I'm like, that's interesting. <laughs> And indeed, that was a thing, yeah? So he was using uh, the same administrator's password locally into the domain. I was shocked, because we all know that this is like the horriblest thing that could happen, yeah? But it was a funny uh, play that we had in between each other. Uh, so that I, I was like, yeah, I'm domain admin, indeed. <laughs> um, anyway, so this is basically what leads us to the first scene, yeah? So misunderstanding passwords. Uh, very, very often in the infrastructure, and we are starting from the kind of a low, low ground right now, so this is quite straightforward, quite easy too, but unfortunately happening. So very often in the infrastructure we see that some passwords are reused, yeah? And uh, my favorite part is that when we are extracting hashes from ntds.dit, we sometimes see that if, even though, administrators are using different types of accounts, so whatever, ADM underscore or user underscore or any other name, so user account and administrator account by the administrator, these two accounts, they have the same password. Yeah, so that, it's not very rarely seen. Or, for example, um, I was doing the Pentas in New York in a kind of a um, scientific research type of company, and then the same thing happened. The administrator who was just like administering systems, so he was not like the core admin, but he was like a helpless person, was also responsible for managing network infrastructure. So as it appeared, the password that he had was the same as to the network devices. So that's why I'm saying we are misunderstanding them. That's the first thing. Second, we shouldn't forget that whenever we put the password, you always share it with some other maybe not necessarily people, but maybe people, but some other mechanisms, yeah? So you configure IIS, you put the passport somewhere, of course it's extractable. It all relies on a data protection API system, yeah? So anybody who has access to this computer is able to extract this particular password, and that is something that I would like to show you. So our session today, our keynote, is basically demo packed. So I hopefully, hopefully you are ready for that, yeah? Uh, so, couple of couple of things here. What we're we gonna do? So, um, whenever we are thinking about uh, different types of um, cases that are related with uh, IIS, so that's gonna be the first first thing here. Uh, what I would like to get to is the situation where in IIS, so let's pretty much get there. Uh, we've got on the server level the situation where there is, and let me just go down with the config there is centralized certificates, yeah? And centralized certificates, we've got here edit feature settings. Now, this is kind of funny because, and again, let's don't get too excited that, oh yeah, in IS we've got passwords and they are about to be decrypted. Of course they're gonna be decrypted because Windows uh, Process Activation Service needs to know those passwords in order to operate on them. My point for that part is that not only they are to be decrypted, but they are fetchable by everybody that has access to that server. And the question is, of course, who is this? Because this person used this password to move forward, um, absolutely. Let's have a look. So I've got here a couple of dots, and this is pretty much p at ssw0rd. So they are not really hiding, like they are not just putting the dots um, as it could be done in a services configuration, but here, uh, technically, we are able to see the password. So let's see uh, where is it. Well, this particular password we are able to find in the registry. And uh, what I would like to show you is, uh, let me go to PowerShell ICE. Um, I would like to show you how we are able to extract this particular particular password. So uh, I have a script over here. It's called IAS was here. This is, uh, this is the script that um, we, we, we just written. The very funny part about that is that, and that's the beauty about encryption using Windows, you really don't know when you are fetching some encrypted string, like how is it encrypted? Because it depends on the team, these things are usually the encrypted uh, based on the author's invention, yes? Of course they are, or there is some API of Windows used, but are we reversing that string or not? What if you've got like 20 levels to go down with that? So this is pretty much uh, how it's happening in Windows, and when we do the research, Oh my God, sometimes it takes over six months to figure out the, the path to decrypt a certain string just because you don't know and there is no documentation and no standard 
or how things are encrypted in Windows. For the fact that we use algorithm, that's fine, because in Windows we mostly use AS uh, in a different variants, uh, mostly 256, but again, I don't want to summarize it this way. But do you use this key this way, or you revert it, and so on? You kind of don't know that, so you always have to try. So we're going to be working on the test.xml. But in order to fetch it, we need to get into uh, our tool. So ASP.NET Rec IAS gives us one thing, and that is the PX option. And the option PX um, for the configuration uh, is the one that allows us to export an RSA keeper. Exactly. How do I know that an RSA provider is using IIS? Well, we can always sniff it, uh, so that's absolutely no problem. Yeah, we're always able to check, for example, here, uh, when you are actually saving the password, so this is Procmon, that we are fetching over here the system's data protection API. So I'm getting into crypto RSA machine keys, which clearly indicates that I will need to use, in this particular case, RSA provider, and that's data protection API system. Bring it on. So um, let's move forward. So again, we're going to get into console. Here we go. And then container and the file. And the command is super simple. So we've got ASP.NET rec IIS minus PX, and then we are specifying container. And IIS, WIS, so Windows Activation Service here. Um, oh, not here, the key, of course. And then we've got uh, C and then we've got test.xml, and then we specify minus pri in order to export the private keys. Succeeded, yeah? So, very nice tool, and this is how we perform the backup of the IIS encryption keys. Very light, rarely done thing by administrators. We just like copy the website and that's it, while we don't really extract or export the encryption keys. Important uh, if you don't want to change or overwrite your password in a server configuration. Okay, good, so we've got that done, yeah? So let's move forward, what this password is about. So uh, I'm gonna get back into PowerShell. Here we go, and uh, I'm just gonna run the selection, so I'm gonna select the script, and then a fade, we've got it. And then at the end, oh, let's see, aha, the buff is good, the buff is um, not correct. And then we can do this again, and a fade. And then as you see, the password is being extracted, yes? Because the password for the IAS, it is clearly stored in, uh, we've got, of course, local machine, software, Microsoft IIS, central cert provider, and that's the password for the private key that is used in a certificate store in IIS. Not a big deal, but what is important to remember is that when we always put a password somewhere, someone else, some other service, knows it. Yeah? And uh, this, is, this is my point over here. Now, if someone manages to get the password like that, question is, what can we do next? Yeah, so what we will do next within the pen test, for example, is that we're going to take this password and we're going to put it into, and this is the beta of our new tool. Uh, it looks absolutely crappy, I know, but who cares? Uh, it does the job. Yeah. Uh, so um, we're going to specify the host name, so 10.10.10, 10, 10, uh, 10, and I'm going to specify here user account, and I'm going to specify here the password file. So I got pass.txt, so this is a SQL server. But it doesn't really matter because you can load over here in a tool the file with a different types of hosts. Yeah? So give me all the IP addresses, all the possible accounts to be used, and all the passwords that I ever encountered during the pen test, and I'm checking if they are ever reused anywhere. So I'm using SSH, I'm using SQL, MySQL, uh, whatever, MS SQL, so all the different types of protocols. So this is for the password reuse test. I always wanted to have a tool like this, so this is basically uh, what we are working on right now. MS SQL, for example, and then not a big deal, because of course at the end it authenticates, but what's the beauty about the tool is that it checks for all the possible services around for the password that we encountered on our way within the pen test, just to make sure that you are not reusing them. And yeah, very often we find the passwords being reused, also by administrators in various ways. Now, we could be thinking, okay, what then? Should we use KeePass? Uh, wait, wait, uh, we are not over with the presentation. I would like to show you what's wrong about KeePass. So that's gonna be that day. Okay, so we got this. Now, no network segmentation. Uh, yeah, totally. So different types of attacks are possible thanks to RP poisoning, yeah? So, or port security on the switches is, is not on. Absolutely, so you are able, or we are able at the end, uh, to sniff um, things around. Yeah? So 
different types of connectivities, different types of certificate spoofing, and so on. Let me tell you the one way how I managed to get access to a company in Boston. Basically, one of the administrators, um, again, in the morning, he was doing the standard work, and he was connecting to network devices, uh, where there was an HTTPS configured, and oh, that's fine. But who really manages certificates on devices? If you do, awesome, that's the point. But if vast majority of the companies, if you go to the HTTPS, whatever, Cisco switch, then what you got, it's a self-signed certificate applied on a connection. So we are all used to see in our infrastructure that that certificate is invalid. So this habit of clicking, yes, I want to go because I know this website is okay, is a very wrong thing. And the reason why I'm saying this is because due to RAP poisoning and the traffic spoofing, what we are doing, and again, you can do this with available tools in the internet, we are spoofing the traffic, the certificates across the traffic, and then this administrator gets the same type of looking website, but with our certificate on it. I mean, who normally remembers serial numbers for certificates? I mean, maybe you do, but I mean, that would be cool. So no. Uh, so this guy sees the same type of website, so he clicks OK. He types in his password, and it really depends on the security of the application there. Yes, is the password encrypted within the HTTPS tunnel or not? Because what is quite shocking is that after so many years, LinkedIn has been hacked, for example, if you do sniffing for a password inside the HTTPS tunnel, LinkedIn, for example, they don't encrypt their password. What? Like, we live in 2017. I would expect that that time is over, but apparently not, yeah? So, uh, what's the flow? The flow is that I would like to show you a very simple thing that is actually the traffic spoofing, so hopefully everything will be fine. And this is our this is our spoofer here. So um, what's the what's the point? And again, all of the tools that I'm talking about, they are available to download for free from our blog. We always share for free all the tools. Uh, quite recently, we have uh, boosted our spoofer for uh, RP. Yes. Yeah, so question is, do we have an RP spoofing tools on Windows? Well, not many, that are really good. Usually they're available for Linux, but we have written our own, so um, we are absolutely happy to share. Yeah? So what's the flow? The flow is very straightforward. Uh, we can specify over here uh, client IP. Uh, so this is, this is a simple case, or client. And we can specify what's going to be the client of what. So the client's going to be 10, 10, 10, in my case, 200. And you can specify uh, the gateway, so it could be uh, GW, and then the gateway is going to be 10, 10, 10, 10 for the traffic. Yeah, so I'm performing the um, spoofing right now. So sniffing, uh, spoofing, fantastic. So the tool is launched. Now, again, very simple thing, but I just want to tell you that if someone launches something that, like this in the infrastructure and you wait for the moment, uh, usually we are able to get something. So starting with the simple protocols to be used, ending up with things like SMB uh, not being signed and TLM version 2, this is basically what we are getting to. Now, what's the, what's the flow over here? The flow is very straightforward again. Um, if we got uh, just a simple connection, even though FTP, uh, I mean, whatever, yes, it could be really anything. Uh, I'm sniffing on the, on the machine uh, that is like outside of the scope. So this is 10, 10, 10, 200. That's the client. And her clients wants to connect to 10, 10, 10, uh, 10, whatever. And then, okay, whatever I will type. Hopefully, here we go. We're going we're gonna to manage to, of course, get that, yes? So during the pen test, I've got that running. This services all the different types of connections, yes? I know that well, we all know that FTP runs in a clear text, but that's in that, not my point here. My point is that every single type of authentication that happens, so web form and so on, that is running at some point in the clear text, it's also a target. So how many applications we have like that, yes? So uh, how many of those we know that credentials are actually running in the clear text? Because maybe, you could be, someone could be like authenticating to some crappy app that nobody pretty much cares about, but at the end, the password is reused, so that password will be leveraged somewhere else. Maybe this is the same password to the user's computer's uh, session, so we log on, maybe user is a local admin, then we've got the pass the hash, or maybe not, or maybe something from the memory, and so on. Yeah, one of the ways how I was managed to get access to one of the banks was just because of the user was leveraging some app. This is the this is basically the scenario based on the real situation, and this and that was actually she. She was an administrator of SAP server somewhere there, normally just being a user. 
but I was able to get access to the administrative to server environment just because there was a simple uh, relationship um, like this. Yeah? So as you see, uh, this is a very, very simple spoofer, but we wanted to make it like super effective. Yeah? Now, another part is related with the old protocols and their default settings. So this is sin number eight. Yeah? Now, what do we mean by that? Not to mention SSL, TLS, which is a classic, yeah? so the SSL being an absolute old screw right now, uh, TLS is pretty much uh, the only option, 1.1 plus. Now, this is the first thing. Second, I was mentioning NTLM version 2, totally. NTLM version 2, there is not much we can do, and that's the problem. Um, it's a protocol that is used for authentication. Uh, just to explain a few words, how does it work? So if I do have a server, let's say, that is outside of the domain, I have to connect by using NTLM version 2. So what do I do? I pretty much send a request for access to the server. Server says, okay, that's pretty cool. This is this blob of data, please encrypt it with your hash, with your password hash, so MD4 as we use it in Windows, and then please send it back to me. And because I know the hash of the password that you're going to be using, I'm going to compare, and if it's the same, I'm going to authenticate you. The problem is, in the current world, and that's not a very loud subject, and that's the problem too, is that if user sends this encrypted blob with the hash to the other server, and someone is performing RP spoofing like I was doing, then we are able to take this challenge, take this blob, and forward it to the other server. Yeah? So this is the case. NTLM version 2 definitely helps it, SMB lack of signing, which I'm going to be talking about later on, also helps it. Yeah. So question is, what do we, uh, what do we see over here, and uh, how do we set it up? So again, very straightforward. Let's get to Linux. And uh, for that purpose, I will use uh, Kali. And the reason why I'm going to use Kali is because it's widely available. Could we use something custom? Totally, we could. Uh, but you can do the same story. Yeah? You can do the same, repeat all the steps that I'm doing right now. That's always my, my point. Yeah? So that everything we do, you're able to reproduce in your environment. So here, I'm going to use the script SMB Relay X. For now, not to relay, but for now, just to show you that NTLM version 2 is widely seen in the infrastructure. And that's something that we should maybe reconsider. So I'm going to run that. So here we go. I'm listening the... Uh, for the NTLM version 2 authentication challenges. And on one of the servers, I will browse the infrastructure, or just like a, another server, by the IP address. IP address, uh, when we do backslash backslash IP address and so on, we enforce the authentication using the NTLM version 2. And of course, in our interest is to use Kerberos, so it's better to use fully qualified domain name, which triggers the Kerberos authentication, but sometimes we just do this by IP address, and that is my point over here. So what I did right now, I have typed the IP address in my other server, and what do we have on this side? It's technically uh, the situation, I'm just gonna um, interrupt this, okay, this is fine, uh, where we are capturing the administrator's authentication challenge. Now, of course, of course, we are hunting for administrators. I can tell you one thing. Uh, that sounds, by the way, very cool, and I'm not bullying around, it was just a funny situation. Um, it happened that we've got a call from customer to do the pen test, and it appears that it's gonna happen in Bahamas, and I'm like, mm, perfect. And I'm like checking out the team's calendar. We've got uh, 20 people in a core team working. I'm like, shoot, I mean, if I mean, I'm the boss, that's kind of ugly to go to Bahamas by myself. Yeah, I want to do this to other people, but Bahamas, other people, I mean, it's a hard decision, yeah. So, and apparently, it, it looks like that this week it was only available for myself. And I'm like, score, yeah, going to Bahamas. And uh, it was a funny situation because it's an island life. So it's very like, laid back and it's very like chill, uh, chill and so on. This was the longest time I was capturing this. Oh my God, For in the morning, Monday, I come back uh, and I'm like, okay, let's see, SMB Relay, classic, it always works. Uh, normally it takes me 15 minutes to get in and so on. In Bahamas, it took a half a day. These guys were doing literally nothing in the morning. Like they were not logging on anywhere. I'm like, what the hell? This is how you can judge the administrator's work. Like what do they actually do? And they were doing literally nothing, yes. 
<laughs> so uh, this, was, this was funny to see. But in the little bit more intense infrastructure, you are able to see something like that pretty much immediately. And yes, we are hunting for admins, and these admins is going to be our session that we're going to establish later on. We're going to be back to this scenario. I just wanted to tell you how we are able to capture that particular situation. Good. So next thing we've got, it's a falling for kind of a hipster tools. Well, sometimes hipster, sometimes not hipster. One of the example is a C cleaner, cleaner, crab cleaner. Did you hear the story? Yeah, so basically uh, CCC Cleaner was affected by malware and uh, millions of people were downloading, I think it was like 20 million or something within the week. Uh, pretty amazing. I was actually waiting from this moment uh, since my childhood. When I saw the tool, I was like, what the hell is this? Why do I need to speed up my windows? Why? This tool is supposed to tell me that. And uh, I was like, hmm, I really feel that this is a little dodgy. And finally, after like 20 years, um, that, that is what we have in this world, that uh, it was affected. Yeah? So we need to know what to use. Now, what is my point over here? Because it might sound a little easy. Mm, no. Whenever we've got a user logged on, and the user saves some credentials somewhere, in the browser, for example, Outlook, uh, BitLocker, by the way, this uses a data protection API and G, so it's a different thing if you rely on the SIT of the user. That's what I'm talking about. If you, for example, have your key pass relying on your Windows credentials, so you've got this single sign-on situation, when you log on to Windows, and then your passwords are there. Yeah, you log on to Facebook, you don't have to type your password because it's there. These are the situations that are interesting. Now, what's the problem? The problem is, and that is a problem with a big P, um, is that every single time we've got the situation with um, credentials, so we, c we have the credentials stored, um, other apps, just because they run as you, and that's the protection, the protection API user, they will have access to your secrets. That's like a 100%. So if we run CCleaner or whatever 7-zip, or whatever process hacker, or these kind of tools, do, can these tools have access to your credentials? Hell yeah, because that is exactly the point of a data protection API user. Now, let's start with a simple demo, and let's bring it up to the conclusion where and what kind of conditions uh, our credentials are safe or not. And this is something that I would like to uh, start with. So, let me start the uh, stuff. So, I am here, logged on as user, how do I know? Well, if I want to, for example, run the command prompt as an administrator, maybe this is enough to prove this, I'm not able to do that because I'm just a user. So being a user, this particular user did one thing. User uses Chrome. Nothing against Chrome, besides the fact that implementation of the data protection API, maybe it's not the best, but still, of course, if I use Chrome Pass, and that's absolutely not a big deal, let's move on, Chrome Pass, Chrome Pass will show me the password. Well, wh well, like, why? Because that is exactly the point that I'm making here. If I store the password in Chrome, any other app run as myself is able to get that password as well. Yeah, that's the fact. In general, we do all rely on something that we call master keys, and these master keys are encrypted with our password hash in the case of a domain user that is MD4. Now, whenever we are thinking about that, well, every single app can know my credentials. So why do I run CCleaner? Why do I run all this 7-zip, whatever, ISO maker in my computer? Am I not afraid that these people out there writing these apps are capable of getting my passwords? Of course, it's a matter of trust, unfortunately, and it's a matter of risk. So you evaluate how comfortable do you feel about that. Um, so this particular, this is the particular case here. So we've got a password. Now, question is, what about getting access to this password offline? So are these tools really crappy? Well, of course, we know that uh, within the same session we'll be able to grab the password. So let's see, because I wanted to uh, prove one point to you. What are we going to do? I'm going to here, uh, first of all, I'm going to take Freddy and I'm going to lock desktop. And here I'm going to log on with a certain password. Um, and I will show you, this is the password p at ssw 0 rd enter, that I log on. Okay, great. So I'm the member of the domain, fun. So I'm going to restart this box because what is happening right now, I would like to show you how by playing a little bit with the something that 
most of the people call cash credentials, and we shouldn't call them credentials, we should rather call, call them cash logon data, if I mingle with them, am I able to still be able to see this password? What am I inclining? I'm inclining that if you do have an illegal password change, if someone steals your laptop, takes your laptop, takes your profile data and so on, the only way to get access to this kind of secrets is either by running up as yourself on that session, and that is pretty much it. Or there's one exception, and this is what we are getting to. So I'm doing this offline to clear the picture. Yeah, it doesn't have to be done offline. So if you have BitLocker, it doesn't really matter because it could be also done online. But this is pretty much the assurance that we have totally no access to any, any environment. I've got a BitLocker drive uh, encrypted, but that's just one of the drives. First of all, settings, just to make sure we've got a cache log on data. Not connected, good. Okay, and let me go to the D drive and I'm gonna get into CQ tools and then I'm gonna go to the Kiwi Secure Edition. In the meantime, I have no impact on that, so let me change the font very quickly so that everybody can see what's happening. Here we go. And we're gonna technically run here Mimikatz. We all know Mimikatz, yes, as a, one, of the, one of the tools. This particular Mimikatz, it's Secure Edition, because we have reverse engineer, we did a reverse engineering for the cache log on data, so that technically we can answer your question, what is actually cache log on data? Because everybody's like, oh no, this is bad because we're using cache credentials. No, 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 cache credentials are totally fine. Cache credentials are stored in registry and they're not credentials, but it's the value of the pbkdf2 function that in order to crack it, you have to struggle like very much. This is the same function that is used by Vault, uh, LastPass, KeePass for the database protection. So it's not that bad. Let's have a look what we can do. LSA dump, cache, and then we're gonna do D, Windows. Uh, I have no possibility to tab, so I have to type it. System32, config, and then D, and then of course we're gonna refer to system. And that is because cache log on data is always encrypted as everything data protection API system with the boot key, which we can find in the system hive. So you always have to grab it. Even if you extract the hashes, you have to grab this. So, C, so D, window, Windows, system, um, 32, and then config, security, and then Kiwi, enter. Kiwi switch allows me to override all these values in the registry. And I've got, for example, Blee and Hank. So all these users ever logged on to my laptop here, yes, I am overriding their cache log on data. Could I crack it? As I mentioned, that's quite hard in the current times. Could I override it? By knowing the algorithm, I'm able just to say, oh, I don't want to crack it, it's hard. I'm just, I'm just gonna override it and I'm gonna set up my own password here. So this booting should happen pretty fast. And the question is, can I log on as Freddy over here uh, with a different password? And answer is, I should. So I type Mimikatz and this is, please have a look, domain user. With the local user, that's a piece of cake. With the domain user, it's a different story. So I'm logging on as a domain user, but this time with a different password, and I'm checking out if I'm able to get access to the user's secret, yeah? So this is what I wanted to show you, yeah? Um, we have overwritten the cache logon data. Now, question is, and knowing the fact that my secrets are protected by the user's password hash, um, am I able to fetch it? Of course, yeah, Chrome pass, and this takes time because I'm trying to decrypt the master keys in the user profile in order to be able to decrypt that secret. But because master keys were encrypted with my previous password's hash, I'm technically not able to do it right now. So what's the conclusion? If you run applications online next to each other within the current user's context, they do have access to their common secrets. If you mingle with the logon, of course you are losing access to your secrets, and that does not include the situation where your domain admin resets the user's password, and let me explain why. Let me explain why. So this is the first thing. Now, second thing. Is it really that data protection API is that safe? And answer is, yeah, probably we wouldn't sit here and be here if it was all perfect, well, isn't it like that, yeah? So what's my point? My point is that what we have uh, done, we have written a little tool over here, um, and that particular tool, uh, and let me show you the, uh, the flow. Um, this is the, here we go. I'm gonna do dear and then LSA. This is the tool, so CQ Elsa secrets dumper. 
that extract from the entities.zit or memory, depends how we run it, uh, the secrets of the user, um, but a very specific user. That's going to be, of course, a domain admin. Now, what I'm going to do, uh, let me explain the flow because it's actually one of the most difficult subjects for today. So, if we do percent up data percent on the Freddy's account, we've got an update of roaming. We go to Microsoft, we go to Protect, and to the user SID. Nice. What do we see over here are different kinds of master key containers, and we can see over here something that is called BK Secure. BK Secure, Secure is just our domain name, BK it stands for backup key. Every single user in the domain has this key in the user's profile. Every single one. That is the public key of the domain. So obviously, question is where is the private key? What does this public key do? do? Uh, well, basically, that's the guy that encrypts the user secrets. So let me put it this way. Each of these files that you see contains two types of keys that encrypt your secret. One, encrypted with your password's hash. Second, encrypted with the public key. So someone being in a possession of the private key, it's a master of puppets in a whole enterprise, and that's my point. Uh, it's really sad, by the way. Uh, okay, so let's have a look. So CQ Elsa's um, secrets dumper. So let's just clear it up. CQ Elsa's secrets dumper takes one parameter, and this is file. So we're going to technically extract file, uh, export it, PFX, yep, one file. And this exported PFX, it's a very dodgy, uh, secure is the password, as you see. It's a very dodgy certificate floating in the domain controller's memory. Let me show you how it looks like. Cert MGR MSC. So I got this in a personal, that's fine. That's this guy, yeah? Issued to nobody, issued by nobody, self-signed, only valid for one year. It's impossible to renew it. So if you hypothetically set up your domain in 2008, it's 2008 to 2009. Yeah. Now, okay, we could be like, what the hell is this? Well, that's the guy that encrypts user secrets, or decrypts eventually user secrets, in a whole domain in ntds.dit. That's what we learn how to extract. And if we go to details, and that's also very funny, it also uses SHUA1. So what about SHUA1 being used from 2008 and now we've got 2017? Hmm, could something happen? Let's think about that. Yeah, so this is my, this is my point over here. Um, now, are we happy about this? Uh, no. Uh, is there something we can do? No. Essentially, no. Yeah, so you just have to live with that, that your domain admin can know everybody's, everybody's secret. So how do we manage to get access to this data? Well, totally, um, we are getting there. So this particular master key, I have identified before as the one that is responsible for the protection passwords, uh, of passwords in Chrome. So I'm going to do shift right click, and I'm going to do copy as path. Yeah, and then I'm going to start the console as a user, yeah, over here, so Freddy, in order to get access to his secret. Uh, so let's go see. No, let's go CQ tools. Here we go, and let's go data protection API, and let's first generate a hash that we're going to use to encrypt the data again, because data protection API always has to be in an encrypted state. So we're going to decrypt the keys with the PFX that we have from the domain and encrypt it with the user's password. Um, okay, so we've got this, Mimikant is my password, it's for Freddy, so that's going to be this one. And then I'm going to use CQ, master key AD, with the following parameters. File, where I specify my master key. New hash, where I take this guy, Pink. so this is for encryption. And PFX, exported PFX, that's the one that we've got from the domain. For the, for the decryption. Now, what happened, and this is nice, I got over here key, it's called AD modified, it's a new one, so let me just replace them first, and then in a moment I'm going to change the attributes for the uh, system and hidden, so this is a good key, and AD modified is the one that is decrypted by the PFX from the domain, so let's do that, here we go, enter, yes, and then I'm going to give it an attribute of the system and hidden. Our tool already generates the command, so you can, you can just copy that and literally paste it, enter, and then we have it. Okay, question is, what now? 
can I, by this operation, get the user password? And answer is totally yes. What's the conclusion? Conclusion is that all of your secrets in the organization are as safe as domain admin is, or domain controller data is, or domain controller backup is, or whoever has access to the domain controller. Yes, that's the case. Second, your secrets are as safe as your password length. Yeah? So these are the two conclusions that are everlasting in the case of a data protection API setup. Now, I wouldn't be myself if we didn't continue here. Question is, can we, for example, use that information and get access to KeePass? Answer is, yeah, totally. When you see KDBX, we are like, oh, no, no, it's probably like secure. No, totally not. It depends on how you, sa how you save it, how you secure it. Because if you rely on Windows credentials, when you use KeePass, for example, then it's a very bad idea if you are a domain member. Yeah? Just use your password just like that. Let me prove this. Yeah? So what do we have over here? So we've got analysis folder, and I got a CQ base. That's the database for the user. If I type secure, as I would do in a moment uh, by getting access to this as a password, then it says it doesn't work. OK, so fair enough. Fair enough. I can just cancel. That's it. But using the technique that I used before in the presentation, so this is a shortened way, I have decrypted uh, the Freddy Krueger's master key for the KeePass database. And the KeePass database you, works in a way that the database is always encrypted by the protected user key bin. Yeah, so there is a file that is stored in the roaming in the user's profile that is responsible for encrypting this database. OK, not anymore. Let's have fun. So we're going to use for that two tools. First of all, uh, not this one. First of all, CQ KeePass DB Decryptor. And that's the one that I'm going to use for entropy. Because in Data Protection API, some of the solutions use entropy. Like, for example, in SQL Server TDE, Transparent Data Encryption, that we uh, had a chance to break uh, last week. Um, this is basically uh, the one that is using KeePass. Not every time we use Entropy, though. And Entropy, it's a piece of cake because it's, in most cases it's stored in a registry in a clear text. I mean, seriously. So let's move forward. So uh, another one uh, that we're going to use for, for today, it's a CQ Data Protection API blob decryptor. OK, so let's decrypt the blob first. Blob is this bin file that encrypts the KeePass database. So how are we going to do that? So arrow up, then we've got master which I have here. Then we've got entropy, which I have somewhere up there. So let me just get there and copy it. Here we go. This is this one. Uh, no, not the whole thing. Uh, no, it's good. And let's move forward here. OK. OK, perfect. So we put this one. Yeah, And then we specify, of course, the blob. Yeah. So we do blob. And then we specify in the C analysis. Uh, protected, here we go, user key bin. OK, this is unprotected user key, because we have decrypted this by the master key of the user, which we can decrypt by the PFX, for example. Yeah, And then we can use the CQ, key pass DB decryptor, which takes as parameters two things, k for the key that I just have in my clipboard, and the file, which is purely the encrypted KeePass database. Yeah? So let's get in into the uh, whole story. So we're going to do, and here, K for key, blink. And we've got another one, which is file, which is we're going to use for the analysis. And we've got the CQ KeePass base, KDBX, decrypted database to the file. Let's have a look what we have over here. And there is this new file over here. And it's going to ask us for password. I'm going to type secure because our tool re-encrypts it with this password. And then, of course, this is how I'm able to manage to get access to the key pass database of the user. Yeah? So what's the conclusion is when we use all these tools, then basically we should at least know how they work. And uh, we should definitely come into conclusion that anything that relies on Windows credentials in the domain is accessible by someone who manages to be uh, domain admin. Yeah? Again, we could be like, oh, domain admin has access to everything. Well, uh, data protection API is supposed to be only for a user, not for the domain admin. But that is exactly my point here. Yeah? Lack of proactive approach in security. That's very simple. Yes. So my point over here is, do we do and do we have appropriate monitoring and correlation in between 
um, many different areas in the, in the infrastructure. Let me give you an example. We do have ransomware. Ransomware will communicate with some kind of a server. Can we spot if this particular process was communicating with this IP address? And the reason why I'm asking is because very often we focus on firewalls, network configuration, and software execution prevention and stuff like that. We don't map these two things. Maybe you do, that is awesome, but usually this is the gap that is missing. So can I, for example, have the situation where I'm able to map network communication to uh, the process? And the answer is totally, totally I can. So what do I have over here? Uh, and let me get to the whole uh, case. I have in my local laptop running Sysmon. I've got a Sysmon configured uh, to be uh, able to monitor my network. What I want to show you is how we're able to leverage information about uh, the network usage by Sysmon and correlate activity IP address versus process. So let me get into my tools. So users, Pula, uh, Docs, and Sysmon. Yeah, and then I've got a tool over here which is called Sysmon, CQ Sysmon uh, Net Analyzer. And CQ Sysmon Net Analyzer, it's super straightforward. It uses the directory where the Windows logs are. So we do go Windows, we go System32, yeah, and then we specify our logs. Mm, let me just do that. Logs, 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 here we go. And, uh, no, 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 uh, win, 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 win. Ah, oh, okay, let me just grab this. Um, I will just type this. So let me just move over here, yeah? Uh, and I will just copy that. So we've got a Windows, a Microsoft Windows, um, and then Sysmon, here we go. Let's get there. And uh, we've got here, Sysmon log, perfect. Yep, and let's go here. And in the properties, of course, here we go. We've got it over here, yeah? So we've got WinAVT logs. So this will be the funniest part. Yeah, let's get in this one. Yep, we need VT logs, and then we specify the out, and then it's going to be network uh, .txt. Yeah, and what happens right now? I'm extracting from Sysmon logs that are related with the network. Eventually, I'm going to have a text file. This tool we have optimized for our customer that has 25,000 computers, and they're running Sysmon, and they want to know. Yes, so it works actually pretty pretty fast. I have several thousands of events. Uh, right now we've got 20,000, so we can wait for the moment. Uh, approximately, it's, approx it's usually like 100,000 events per workstation that are to be analyzed. And at the end, I am generating the file that I'm going to put later on in an Excel spreadsheet and find out what's going what's gonna to happen and what kind of different types of uh, processes I had running in my network. So we could be waiting for this one. Let me just use the file that I have already prepared. So this is the case with uh, Excel. And I'm going to import the data from a uh, text. Let me just get there. Yep, I got my network here. Yep, this one is still running. And I just use another file, which is a very similar file. So I just go next, next, and then finish. OK, and I'm doing this the import to Excel. And that kind of export that we have over here looks like this. So I can do Control A, of course, not a big thing. Insert table, my table has headers, yep, yeah, very good. And here I'm able to specify like what kind of processes from Sysmon, executables are running as who, on what kind of workstation, we're communicating with what kind of, and let me just move forward, what kind of IP addresses. So let's just get into the end, almost to the end. Yeah, so here I'm able to get this information from the whole computers in the infrastructure. So you can see which processes with who. Yeah, so this is this gap that we have. Now the best part is you can take this column and if you are really interested who that is, since we totally cannot rely on the rev DNS because rev DNS is controlled by the other side, um, which is kind of funny always when the firewalls are showing as rev DNS. Who cares? Um, if people can say they are from Microsoft at the end. IPNet info. It's going to be the tool that I'm going to use. That's not our tool. This is a tool that you get from Nearsoft, Blink. And then I'm going to put here the column of the IP addresses that I had from that uh, area. And then, of course, at the end, I'm able to see what are the owners of the IP addresses that our apps, all of our apps, communicated with. Yes. So it's enough that you gather Sysmon logs in a certain location, and that is the flow. Yeah. So very nice. 
gap mapping uh, situation. And here, as you see, per workstation approximately, we have uh, 90,000, so 100,000 events, yes? So this is the proactive security approach that I was um, uh, talking about. Let's get back to our scenario. SMB signing, yes? So this is a sin number five. Lack of SMB signing or any other alternative that could help us to prevent what we're going to do. A vector, so for example, the ones that are on a conference, uh, sponsoring the conference, they could prevent something like that because they are actually implementing solution for the code uh, execution prevention. Just an example. So let's see what's the case. The case is that, and I'm going to use for that purpose again, uh, Linux. Yeah, so let's uh, do that. Whatever, here we go. Yeah, so I'm going to rerun my server uh, for the attack, but at the same time, I'm going to specify here listener. And again, that is totally not a big deal for the attack. Uh, should we do this with the Metasploit? No, I'm doing this with the Metasploit because every edge of you has an access to it. I will normally, within the Pentas, do this with our own payload generator that we've written in our team, because payload generator that you write by yourself allows you to generate payloads that are not recognized by antivirus. And that is exactly the point. Because who has seen this payload? Nobody. It's hot. Generated five minutes ago. Yeah. So we've got this. So let's get into the payload setting. Set payload. Set payload. And our payload is going to be Windows. Uh, here we go. Windows. Metapreter. And then it's going to be reverse TCP underscore TCP. Yep, perfect. So we got that. Show options, standard stuff. So we got a port 4444. So I would do set L host on the port 10, 10, 10. It's uh, full. Uh, uh, L host on the, not port, but host 10, 10, 10, 99. So this is good. We are ready to go. Exploit. It's kind of funny. They, it's like, it sounds really cool, like exploit. It's not exploiting, it's just launching the dumb listener on a port. Oh my god. But we feel so much better. Like, you know, there's the techno music missing, running in the background. Um, so let's move forward. So we are listening for the communication right now. What would be important for us, because we are attacking actually the client over here, is to find out uh, the situation on the client. Of course, hacker has absolutely no knowledge right now about what the client's processes are about. So please have a look. This is client. I'm not doing anything over here. I'll be searching for the process that is running a system. It could be this, yeah, 2488, uh, no, 2448 or something. I don't know yet as a hacker, but I would like to show you how I'm going to be uh, trying to find that. Uh, OK, so we've got good, good, good. Now, um, on my side, uh, I will do the same trick as last time. So I'm going to launch one of the con connections here from the server. Here we've got the session open. I do process listing. OK, so I find the process that is running as a local system. And then I do a 2448 migration. So I'm migrating from the process that I'm in right now on that client to some other process that is potentially running as a local system. Yeah? So I am able to spot that information by reviewing this list. The reason why I showed you this process before, because I have only 15 seconds to complete this connection. So I will not, I will not shut up, but just talk about that. Probably I'm going to miss my session over here, just saying. So let's do the stuff, yes? So at that certain moment, if I run shell, of course, who am I? I'm able to see that I'm anti-authority system on host name some kind of a client here, yes? And it doesn't really matter what kind of operating system we are talking about. That is an SMB relay. Horrible, because the problem is here in between SMB and NTLM version 2. Have we had that fixed in, the, in, in our infrastructure? And if the answer is no, something to reconsider. How can we fix this? Well, SMB signing is one of those. Code execution prevention is definitely one of those. Don't forget, sometimes we tend to set up settings that administrators can run everything. In this case, this attack will just work because we are hunting for administrators logging on in the network. So it's a matter of code being signed and not signed, known, unknown, not really that fact that administrators can run everything. That's my point over here. Now, sin number four, and we are almost there. So sin number four, it's a lack of forensic skills. Let's have a look. So this attack happened, yeah? This is my favorite part. How do we know that attack happened? Yes, this is a Windows client, this is our victim. How do I know that that attack happened? I mean, it looks nice and shiny. How do I know? Well, we could be like, why don't we just run netstat? 
Now, let me put it this way. Netstat is one of the biggest liars in the infrastructure because it will not tell you, and it's kind of funny because we have to run it as an admin, <laughs> Netstat, mm, okay, uh, Netstat, minus A and B, let's do more, or we could do that. Now, let's do like more. So basically, here we have information about this connection. But it says either it's system sometimes, or it says cannot obtain the ownership information, or it will tell you the first process that was engaged in this connection, which I already migrated from. So I used the privilege impersonate the client after authentication, and I went somewhere else. So I'm not in that process anymore. So in all three cases that it's possible to search for something, Netstat will not tell you the truth. What is this? Who are you? So in general, like how we are able to find it out? Well, it depends what you have preset. Yeah, in most of the clients, you should have, for example, and let me just close this, things like prefetch running, yes? So if we go into C Windows prefetch, which is not forensic at all, but this is one of the ways how we managed to find out that there was a run somewhere running on the administrative, uh, uh, running on, on, on the customer side. So we've got a prefetch. I have a date, a different date preset over here. So this is the 29th, uh, 3rd, 2017. So we are able to uh, sort it a little bit. Yeah, and basically, yeah, here we're able to spot some kind of an information about what is technically going on. Yes. So different different types of different types of services. Now, a uh, funny part is that Prefetch itself, so we can just uh, do that, Prefetch itself allows us, so if I run, for example, CMD or whatever, yeah, so then basically some of these files here are updated. So this is the, technically the history of what is running. And all these different files that we have over here, yeah, this is the indicator of the attack that we've been doing. Yes. Uh, how do we know that? Well, we are able to spot from Kali Linux all these names yes, of these different types of files that we're executing. Yes? So we've got DVI and so on, and we can try to find if this was at some point cached on that particular client. So we can put it even by the name, and then we can search for this DVI uh, and so on. Yes? So we are able to see, please have a look, guys. Yeah? Uh, this is the one here. Yes. So yes, indeed, we've got a history that something got executed. What if this is called Notepad? You would probably never look at that. Yeah, so my point is that whenever something happened, yeah, why don't we just review our systems? Are they 100% secure? Because we don't know what we don't know about. We can hide the process and you will never see that something is running on your computer uh, unless we know how to check, yes? Because things cannot be really hidden, yeah? So that brings us to next conclusion. Executable can be blocked, but what about the other type of code? What about PowerShell? Yes, can we block PowerShell for the users? Shall we do that? That's a big question with no answer because it depends on your environment, but in general, PowerShell is a fantastic hacking tool within the Pentas because it's there, it always works, and it usually allows you to do a lot of stuff. So what kind of types of code we are able to execute over here? Could we have, for example, vulnerabilities in PowerShell? Could we have run somewhere in PowerShell? Totally yes, and that's what I want to show you. So this is the client, as you remember. We have already met Freddy, and Freddy is a regular, regular user over here. Now, can regular user be a system just like this? Of course not, or better not. But if we leverage a vulnerability that, don't get me wrong, is already patched in Windows, and I really hate showing stuff from the past, it's better to focus on the future, we patch our Windows regularly, yeah? so basically, hmm, basically um, uh, that, should be, that should be all done. But I want to show you the way how this was designed, because that is actually pretty cool. So what do I have over here? Uh, not this way, <laughs> but definitely this way. Here we go. So I got over here, Elevate CMD. I'm not in a uh, PowerShell, so this is PS1. I'm not in a PowerShell right now. I'm in a command prompt, but I don't care because even though I'm in a PowerShell, I have, and we can technically check this out here by launching PowerShell. We have over here preset the PowerShell execution policy that is restricted, yeah? So we can get into uh, PowerShell, here we go. Uh, yeah, let's just start it. Yeah, and then let's have a look. Yeah, 
so we've got that. Oh, come on, start, start. And uh, we, will, we will check, of course, what's the ex execution policy uh, case here. Okay, good. So we can do, we can do PowerShell. No, oh, come on. Yeah, this is how many times I press enter because I'm very impatient. Uh, get execution policy. Uh, here we go, restricted, yeah? So <laughs> all that to show you just this. Okay, let's move forward. So um, yeah, I'm gonna get back to my comment prompt. That's what I want. So if I do type elevate CMD and I pipe it to PowerShell uh, and then I run it with the no profile dash, elevate CMD, it's a export for vulnerability of handling handles in Windows. Uh, in a PowerShell, purely available in PowerShell. Now, this one, PowerShell no profile, is one of the 20 ways to bypass execution policy, which has never been designed for security, but in general, that's the, that's the concept. And if we do execute it, so I already pressed enter, that particular vulnerability is getting exploited, and uh, we are becoming a system out of the blue from the user's context. Yeah? We could be like that, okay, this is patch, we don't care. No, not necessarily because all the other vulnerabilities, I mean, everybody would love to have them in a PowerShell right now. So that is pretty much the direction over here. Question is for you, do you allow PowerShell to be run by user or not? Yeah? Because when I do pen test, that is something that is definitely in my interest. So next thing, and this is a kind of 3B, no whitelisting on board. Yes. So in general, PowerShell running as a user. So scripts, it's one thing. We could also compile things in Windows, in a C Windows uh, Microsoft.NET Framework 64 version of .NET folder. There is a executable called CSC. Yes, within the framework, that is an internal operating system compiler. And if you have a CS files, you are able to compile your own code inside on place. So it's great, but still it, it still compiles to an executable. What about DLLs and so on? Question is, do we block them? And that is technically one of the uh, must uh, to implement trends uh, that we see within the infrastructure. There's plenty of customers that did that. Uh, they did it on the servers, but the problem with implementation, for example, even of AppLocker and so on, is that if we do allow people or users to run everything from the C Windows folder, uh, what is important is that in Windows folder, user has access to so many different folders with a right permission. So C Windows temp, C Windows tracing, are the two basic ones for the start. If you do access check from sysinternals, you run it with the minus W parameter on Windows folder, you will see to how many folders actually users have access to. And how do we care about the situation where um, we've got it all allow from C Windows? Oh great, so Windows just user, user just puts the stuff in a C Windows folder and then this person is allowed to run that. So we've got that. Sin number two, and we are again running to the end. Trusting solutions without knowing how to break them. Totally, yeah, totally. What do I mean by this? It's a situation that we've got our sysmon, and this is all very cool and nice. Can I break it? Yep, you can. But wait, sysmon is a driver, so how am I supposed to do that? Now, you know what's in the deployment, quite interesting. We've got something that is called desired state configuration to make sure that the configuration of the server is good. Now, question is, what do we check for? In System Center, what do we check for? Status of services? Okay, great, so the service of Sysmon will be running, but the driver will be unloaded. So you will never see that that, that service is down. That is my point for the next case. Let's have a look. What do we have and how can we eventually uh, un unload it, yes? Um, so this is a very simple, simple demonstration. Uh, FL, FLTMC uh, instances, uh, well, once again, uh, FLTMC. Did I type MC? Uh, FLT? Oh, FTL. Okay, instances. Allows us to list all the different monitoring instances for for that particular um, setup. As you see, I got here Sysmon driver monitoring the C drive. This is a built-in Windows tool. Yeah, monitoring the C drive. Can I do something about that? Well, of course. Yeah, I can copy the Sysmon driver C. Yeah, let's do that, CLS, and then I can run the rerun re re this, and then the, I, then I can do detach and sysmon driver on the C, yeah, 
and then I will rerun the instances again. And I do have Sysmon driver monitoring D and E, but no longer it monitors C. This is how easy is this, yes. Yeah? So still, if we have a look at the service itself, we can do SC query, Sysmon, yeah? and then it's running, but it's not monitoring. Yeah? So this is the first thing. Could I, for example, totally unload it? Answer is absolutely. Yes, you can. And you can even do sysmon unload, so FLTMC, like we had. In this case, we're going to do sysmon unload. And we are unloading sysmon driver, not for C this time, but totally unloading. So if we list the instances, yeah, sysmon, simply speaking, is just not there. So this is even better. So this is a total unload of a driver. We are not only not monitoring the drive, but we are also not monitoring anything per sysmon. Now, question is, if we do query for the sysmon, yeah, it's still running. Yeah? Now, if I, for example, get into event logs where we were for the sysmon, and this is pretty much the last thing. Yeah? Uh, I got sysmon over here, so I'm just going to refresh this. So I got here, the last thing that was happening was uh, 41. And if I run, for example, command prompt, and I just run the new process over here, question is, are we able to spot this kind of details? And for some reason, well, this, these are the logs that I have over here, so I just refresh this, I'm not getting anything, anything new, uh, let me just sort by the uh, date, so this is good, I'm not getting anything new from the process perspective, yes? So this is how you are able to unload this kind of particular, particular data, yes? So Sysmon, can be ruined by that simple FLMT, uh, FLTMC um, mini, mini driver unload. OK, guys, running to the end. Last sin, but before we mention it, one thing to mention. Um, by Financial Times, by 2019, there will be a need of 6 million security professionals. That's kind of funny, because with the current development that we have, we will have something from four to five million soldiers available in the market being capable to cover the security needs of the organization. We deeply believe in this as a team and we are trying to educate people in this particular area. Yeah? So it's getting serious. Like we want to hire someone for cybersecurity. There are no guys like that. Yes? This skill is not developed. So how we are going to defend? That's why I'm saying that the last sin within the organization is the lack of documentation or training in the cybersecurity. That's very much missing. These scenes that I was mentioning, they work pretty much in every organization. And the question is, is this really admin, admin's fault? Or maybe a management's fault? Yeah? So cybersecurity is definitely there, but it's not yet that much in the manager's head or decision maker's head in order to give a little bit more budget for the education for people that's supposed to defend our company. Giving a funny detail, and it's a cruel detail, our government, uh, you will find it in the news as well because it was a loud thing, was trying to hire a security, cybersecurity specialist. Do you know what was the salary of this person proposed? Approximately $1,000 monthly. Totally. We're going to defend so much, right? So it's really the image and perception. I know, it's painful. It's a perception of who is supposed to be protecting our infrastructure and do we actually invest in this kind of skills in our organization. So summarizing presentation, we've been discussing through 10 deadly sins that happen in the organization's networks, infrastructures that we see pretty much every day when performing pentas. Hopefully, you're going to pick two out of ten, I'm not asking for a lot, that you're going to work on and fix. If you wonder if there is any more that are deadly, absolutely, all of them are deadly at the end, uh, when they allow us to get access to the infrastructure. But these are the ones that are from the outside of the network, so we are not in systems, but we are outside and we are able to get access to several systems, and these are the ones that are pretty much immediately rewarding in the infrastructure. So, at the end, thank you so much for listening. Hopefully, you're going to spend more time on reading information within the cybersecurity because uh, it's actually a pretty nice world. In the meantime, I would like to invite you to our blog where we publish free content about cybersecurity, all the research and so on. The blog is secureacademy.com and definitely please have fun at the conference because uh, this is one of my favorite conferences and hopefully you're going to feel about it the same. Thank you so much and have a good day.